Heavenly Father, we worship you. A family renews their faith in God and makes contact with a loving spirit. My grandmother, her presence is still with me every day. When suddenly, something dark invades their home. You could feel the evilness. There is something that is not human. I was so scared that I couldn't even speak. Now they must fight for their souls in the ultimate battle between good and evil. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows and in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Among the shadows of Horseshoe Mountain outside of Little Rock, lies the small town of Greenbrier, Arkansas, where Chris and Roseanne Cupert live an idyllic life. With Chris, he has been my shoulder to crawl, and he has been my laughing buddy. It looks amazing. <laughs> the flowers? Yeah, those too. <laughs> He's there for me with any and everything that I've ever needed. My wife is my best friend. I mean, she is my absolute sunshine when I think everything is just absolutely coming to an end. Race to the pool. Thank you. So Ronnie. And in the spring of 2013, Greenbrier is the perfect place to raise their two children, 13-year-old Justin and 10-year-old Brittany. There was plenty of space for our kids, plenty of space for the family to grow. It was something that we were looking forward to having for the rest of our lives, and the kids could ha have some place to call home. Historically, Greenbrier, Arkansas, was a thorny wilderness that people only passed through. In the 1830s, Native American nations crossed here during the forced relocation of tribes known as the Trail of Tears. Today, Greenbrier is a peaceful bedroom community. Greenbrier, it's very much everybody knows everybody home feeling in that town. And that's one of the things that really drew me and my family to that place. There, let me get that for you. Really thriving this year. In our home, there is a red plant they call a rooster comb. These unusual flowers are very special to Chris. My grandmother grew them when we was little. She was a very warm and charming, you know, person. And every time we were, were around them, it was just like an air of air of goodness, and it just made us all happy. My grandmother passed in October 2003. I do feel like her presence is still with me every day. Never better. OK, well, keep an eye on the kids. I'm going to go start dinner. Sure thing. When he said that he could feel her spirit watching over our family, that just made me feel like someone is looking over me to make sure I don't get hurt. We felt very blessed to say this is our home and this is where we will have our roots for the rest of our life. And it was just like our dream come true. But the unsuspecting family's dream will soon become a nightmare. And serenity will give way to chaos when their home in Greenbrier becomes a battleground between good and evil. Now war rose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great serpent, who was called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Chris's grandmother taught him the importance of religion and faith. 
I went with my grandmother, and we attended church very, very regularly. But after his grandmother passed, Chris went to church less often, until recently. When the kids got bigger, we wanted to instill core values that my grandmother had instilled in me. I really learned a lot by her, and that's the way I wanted to live my life. As part of their renewed commitment to God, the Cupid family comes together every night to conduct their daily devotional. No longer any place for them in heaven. We had a book. It was 365 stories of the Bible, and it would work through many of the well-known stories of the Bible. We decided that we needed to get more involved at church and go like on Sunday morning and afternoons and Wednesdays so we can learn more about God. Each time we went to church, we would get more faithful and we would have devotionals every night. Do you know what the story's about? The war in heaven between God and the devil. That's right. But as the family's devotion to God grows stronger, something starts to affect <laughs> the family members one by one. Heavenly Father, we worship you. We give you praise. Help us to grow in faith and guide us in your ways. It all begins when Roseanne senses evil. I did get a very uneasy feeling. It was very unnerving. To help others when they are in need. It's nothing that you can actually see, but you can obviously feel what is there. But to Roseanne, the feeling is not entirely new. She remembers the same sense of dread after she toyed with the supernatural as a child. Let God watch over us today and every day. Amen. Amen. All right, kids. Go get your homework done. All right. <gasps> Are you OK? Yeah, I'm fine. OK. I had just an uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach, but it was one of those things that I would just brush it off, thinking it was just all in my own head. Later that night, Roseanne is overcome with the sensation once again. I was standing in a kitchen area, and I had noticed it was extremely cold. It's like the coldness goes from one side of my body around to my back. My first thought is it's got to be the air. And I start feeling, well, there's no air blowing from the air vent at that particular moment. It made the hair on the back of my head stand up like someone's there and not seeing a soul. Soon after Chris Cupid moves his family into their new home in Greenbrier, Arkansas, 
he feels the warm and protective spirit of his beloved grandmother. I was very sad that she passed, but it's a comforting feeling knowing that she is around. But his wife, Roseanne, has sensed a different presence, something sinister in nature. I just get this feeling that eyes are on me. And it, it scared me. It was just kind of a spine tingly feeling. It was there, just a quick glimpse, but it really disturbed me. I was trying to tell myself, no, this is not anything. Just write it off. What happened? Nothing. It didn't sound like nothing. I was just jumping at shadows, I guess. I did believe that ghosts did exist. But it was always easy to say, ah, uh, no, there's no way that could really happen. But it turns out Roseanne isn't the only family member having strange experiences. I was in my room, and then all of a sudden, I just heard this hum. So the girl walk into town. If you don't watch out, you'll fall down. So the girl walk into town. If you don't watch out, you'll fall down. What's that you're humming, Britt? Just a song I heard. It was just kind of odd because my grandmother used to hum that song, and she did that when I was little because she'd bounce, bounce us on her knee doing that. My kids have never heard this. My daughter's never met, you know, my grandmother. She passed a month before my daughter was born. Here's how the girl walking in town. If you don't watch out, she'll fall down. Where'd you hear it? Susie Q. Susie Q. Somebody said Susie Q. So I just told them it was Susie Q. Susie Q. Chris is doubly surprised. If my grandmother forgot somebody's name when I was younger, she'd always say, oh, that's Susie Q over there. I can't remember her name, but that's Susie Q. And that's something that me or my wife never said. And for her to just pick up on that and start saying, it was just kind of really, really, it's just mind boggling. You saw the girl walk in the town. If you don't watch out, she'll fall down. In the spring of 2013, the Cupid family gathers for their usual daily devotional. Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing our family, and thank you for letting us feel the differences between right and wrong. This time, like her mother before her, Brittany senses an evil presence. What is it? I felt like something was watching me. I don't know. Sorry. It's OK. Dear Lord, please help us to become close to you and to protect us from evil as we make our way to heaven. Amen. Amen. I thought it was my imagination, so I just kept it to myself. But once again, something's been awakened in the house.
In 2013, Chris and Roseanne Cupid, along with their two children, are deepening their devotion to God. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. When they suddenly sensed the presence of two entities in their Greenbrier, Arkansas home. The spirit of 10-year-old Brittany's great-grandmother appears to be watching over her, singing sweet songs into her ears. You don't watch out, you'll fall down. Do, 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 do. It just kind of shocked me because she's not alive and she can't talk to me. Help us to grow in faith and guide us in your ways. While a dark force menaces the family. But one thing's for certain. The night belongs to the evil one. And tonight, it's after Brittany. trembling. She was crying. I could not get her to calm down. The devil's trying to get me. It's OK. It's just a bad dream. It wasn't a dream. I was so scared that I couldn't even speak. Nothing's going to happen to you, OK? Now, let's go back into your room. No! Please don't make me go back in there. It was more than just a nightmare. That nightmare felt like it was real life. Brittany, I promise I'm not going to let anyone hurt you. Can't I just leave in here tonight? OK, come on. come on. After having some of the experience I had at that point, I was afraid that it could have been more than just a dream. For now, Chris and Roseanne managed to soothe their daughter's fears. But Brittany's terror is just beginning. Each night, the entity returns. Brittany's older brother, Justin, grows concerned. The first time that Brittany had a nightmare, I didn't pay any attention to it, but it kept happening, so I started getting a little worried. It was like once a week, and then twice a week, and then it ended up to be every day. She never told me anything about her nightmares. She just told me that they were really bad, and she didn't want to talk about them. Our Heavenly Father, please help Brittany to know that you were watching over her. I would pray that I would stop having these nightmares because they scared me to death, and I didn't know what to do. And that her family will always be there for when she needs us. We knew something was going on, but we didn't know how to reach out to her, how to, you know, to help her. I mean, she was just so sad and so just, you know, distraught, I guess is the best word for it, that she was just not our little girl. But the dark force is relentless. It now sets its sights on its next victim. Justin. The air felt muggy and thick. I knew something odd was there, and I couldn't put my finger on it. Justin? I just kind of pushed it to the side like a no big deal. Fill our family with love and light, and guide us so that we can be closer to you, our Lord. Amen. Amen. That night.
I was in the shower and I heard this creak. And I didn't know what it was. Hello? For more a haunting, visit destinationamerica.com. Just north of Little Rock, in the small town of Greenbrier, Arkansas, a mysterious and evil entity has been tormenting Roseanne Cupid and her 10-year-old daughter, Brittany, for months. Like, you can feel that it's there, but you can't do anything. The only thing you can really do is pray that it'll go away. Please, God, please, God, protect me. I was just freaking out, like, am I going crazy? Am I imagining things, or is this real life? And now it has set its sights on her older brother, Justin. Ah! I saw this hand come straight for me. Hey, what is it? What's wrong? I was in the bathroom, and someone reached out and grabbed me. And I told them that my shoulder was on fire, and they looked at it, and I had three marks on my shoulder. I started to see things, and my brother saw things, and now it's hurting us. I was like, what is he going to do next? It hurts. Wow. After Justin's attack, Chris and Roseanne fear for their family's safety. Dad, I'm scared. With everything that was going on, I thought the home could be haunted. That was very, very scary. As a mother, you want to do everything in your power to protect your children. We can't do this alone. We need help. There is something that is not human that is trying to get in the middle of our family. This is not anything we can fight on our own. Desperate to rid his home of a terrible evil, Chris turns to his pastor for guidance and support. I think he was overwhelmed by it. He said, I do believe in the afterlife, but I don't know what to, I can tell you except for maybe just tell you to pray. But their faith only appears to make the entity angrier. It just seemed like everything was hopeless at that point. Where do we turn from there? I was fearful for my kids, and I was fearful for my wife, and me being the man of the house, I wanted to protect them. The evil entity has the Cupid family right where it wants them, vulnerable and weak. And even moving away from the house won't help. 
Everywhere that I went, I felt like it was following me. There is no escape. In October of 2013, the Cupids reach out to Wesley and Melissa Fox of Branson Paranormal. Yes, thank you. When the Cupids first contacted me, they were really fearful for everything that was going on in their home. They were scared for their daughter. They were scared for their son. But also, they were scared for each other as well. Hello. I just want to thank you for helping us with this. When I knew Wesley and Melissa were coming to the house, I was thankful. We need somebody to get this thing out because we can't live like this. When I first met Brittany, it was like stepping out in the sunshine for the very first time. The warmth that you feel. God bless you, and thank you. Our love of God is another thing that is very unique for her. Her faith is unshaking. It's not like anything I've ever seen before, especially in a child her age. The investigators work quickly to gather evidence of any paranormal activity in the house. Wesley uses an EVP, or electronic voice phenomena recorder, to capture any unknown sounds or voices from beyond the physical world. Is there anyone here in the room with me? And if so, what is it that you want? The EVP was in Latin. And it was actually translated to children's souls. While Wesley conducts the EVP session, Melissa is drawn to Brittany's room. I am a psychic empath. I hear things that the average person does not hear. I see things that the average person does not see. She immediately senses two distinct presences. When I first walked in, I could feel different entities. One of them was Brittany and Justin's great grandmother. But the other, I wasn't real sure about at first. I just thought it was something dark. And the sinister force appears to be growing stronger. Started feeling the negative energy, the hatred. Suddenly, it's as if Melissa has entered its lair. I could see spiders. I could feel spider webs going across my face on my arms. I saw spiders everywhere. It's the fall of 2013 in the small town of Greenbrier, Arkansas. For the past several months, a dark entity has been terrifying Roseanne Cupid and her two children, 10-year-old Brittany and 13-year-old Justin. Hello? No place is safe. The evil follows them wherever they go. We finally realized this entity was not just a haunting at our house. This entity was attached to the family. Moving would have done us no good. At that point, the only option that we have is to fight back. The family calls in Wesley and Melissa Fox of Branson Paranormal to come to their aid. The evil force lures Melissa, an empath, into her worst nightmare. As we were going through the house, I myself was experiencing my own battle, my own issues, my own problems. My biggest fear is spiders. <gasps> I'm terrified of them, actually. I couldn't breathe. I had to get out of there. I had never felt that much hatred before in my life, and it scared me. Rattled, Melissa knows she must remain strong for the family 
as she and Wesley reveal the results of their investigation. I felt two distinct presences in the house. One of them is your grandmother, Chris, and the other entity is a demon. That was one of the scariest times that I can remember throughout this entire experience. That let me know there was a reason my children had suffered so much. Has anyone in the home ever experimented with tarot cards or a spirit board? No. Well, I had a spirit board when I was a child. Did you have any unusual experiences with it? Well, I was just a kid. Tell me. When I was younger... So have you ever done this before? No. I was having a sleepover, and I drug out my spare board. We all sat in the middle of the room. We had several candles lit, and we decided we are going to see who can talk to us. Is there someone here in this room with us? <sighs> OK, put it back in the middle. Who are you? Can you tell us your name? Quiet. If you're real, please give us a sign. Can you make your presence known? This is stupid. grabs my ponytail and actually pulls my head back. <laughs> Very funny, Roseanne. You're right. This is, this is stupid. We should do something else. Although Roseanne's encounter happened many years ago, to Melissa, the haunting now makes sense. I think this demon has attached itself to you ever since that day you invoked it through the spirit board. Once you do that, you open yourself up, you open your free will to things attaching to you, which can affect you later in life. It doesn't necessarily affect you at that moment in time, but it can follow you into adulthood. I felt beyond guilty because this is what has caused my babies so much grief. It absolutely broke my heart. But the things we've been telling you about, it's only been happening for a few months. Something woke it up. Our theory was this attachment lay dormant for many years. But as soon as they had children and started to go to church on a regular basis, this woke up the demon. Because now the demon was sure that it was losing these kids to God. Thank you for blessing our family, and thank you for letting us. It showed itself because they became more active in church. They started doing nightly devotionals. What is it? And the family as a whole became more spiritual. They became closer to God. But there's more. When Melissa felt the presence of the demon in Brittany's room, she also sensed its intentions. I knew that it was there for Brittany, that it wanted her. Because here, this little innocent girl that loved everything, loved life, it wanted her. It made me very frightened because it's not gonna leave without a fight. Brittany? See this? It's the Medal of St. Michael. The foxes tell the family that they won't abandon them. And he will protect you. They will bring in an ordained clergyman to perform an exorcism as soon as possible. They really cared about us. And they were doing everything they could to get this out. 
we knew we had to be careful because if you didn't do it correctly and then exercise the demon right, it would come back, and it would come back twice as bad. The Cupid family has no choice but to continue to live in fear of the demon until help arrives. The biggest fear at this point is this thing coming in there and taking one of our lives. It's January 2014, the day of reckoning. Demonologist Joe Eder arrives at the Cupid home. Our demons are out to destroy you. That's what the ultimate goal is. They want to eradicate you from the planet. They hate you. What I do is going into battle because it is a spiritual battle for the person's soul. I bring a St. Michael's candle, and that's the light of God. I bring a Bible, that's the word of God. I bring the medals, that's the warrior of God. You may enter now. We are horrified what the possibilities could be if we can't manage to defeat this demon. I, Brittany Cupid, am a child of God. I was scared so bad because what if it does take someone in my family? What are we going to do? God's love fills my If he couldn't get this thing away from us, I was really afraid it was going to escalate. All evil will leave my heart and my soul and my body. Suddenly. You could feel the evilness in the house. You could hear groans, you could hear moans, you could hear pops, you could hear snaps. It did not want to leave the home. All evil will leave this home, for evil cannot live in God's home. Show yourself. Show yourself. Show yourself, you coward! <laughs> As a teenager, Roseanne Cupid played with a spirit board. Who are you? Can you tell us your name? Unwittingly opening the door for a demon to attach itself to her. <laughs> it lay dormant for years until her family's growing religious faith awakened it with a vengeance. Now, it wants their souls. Show yourself. Show yourself. Show yourself, you coward! I got really angry. I started taunting it. You know, telling it it needed to show itself. It needed to present itself. It, it, it was chicken. And by me doing that, it did. It came on. It felt like there was a spear going through my side. Chris was attacked because he challenged it. You don't challenge a demon. When you get angry, you have a separation with God. It's going to take that and it's going to run with it. Don't lose faith. Keep praying. Joe urges the rest of the family to ignore the demon's ploys and remain strong. No evil will touch or speak to me, for I am at peace. Your faith has to be 100%. You have to believe in it, because if you don't, then the demon's going to stay there. I am now empowered with the power of love and strength of knowing the true sense of who I am. The way to banish a demon is you have to get its name. And once it confesses its name, it has no recourse, it has to go back to its original source. I go into a remote prayer, like a meditation, and the name just comes to me. It's their true name that was given by God. Avadu. You have no recourse but to leave this house.
And then, silence. Oh. Oh. I love you, Dad. Oh. I love you, too. It was just like going from a dark, turning the light switch on. God had taken over. They had that angelic uh, glow around them again, a protection field, as you would say. And that's when I knew it was gone. I knew we could have our life back. We could become the family that we once were. It is now spring 2014. It's been several months since the exorcism, and the Cupids feel like they did when they first moved in, secure and living in a house full of love and prayer. It was very critical. We used our faith as a group to get rid of this. For me, knowing that we helped with that, with God's help, is the greatest feeling you'll ever experience in your life. I could feel madness in the air when it was there. And since it's been gone, it has been more peaceful and calm. We feel the presence of my grandmother back in the house. She was trying to protect us this whole time she was there. But for the family members who did battle with the demon, they will never forget the face of evil. I was happy that it was gone because I didn't like being worried all the time that something's watching you or it's gonna get you when you're not expecting it. It made me realize that the people that say that these things happen, that they're not just like nuts and they're crazy because it happened to me, so I believe them. We had struggled, we were at a rope's end. We had that feeling of just peace, calmness that we hadn't had in so long and words cannot describe, you know, how thankful we are. At the beginning, I didn't believe in this. I thought, like, this was just a fairy tale. But once it started to happen to me, I started to realize that this is real life. Since it's gone, I've learned just put it behind me because now it's not there, so be happy that it's not there. A young woman is repeatedly attacked by an unseen entity in her home. I felt hands around my throat. <laughs> Paranormal investigators try to identify the presence, but it's a desperate race against time. Cross Satan under your feet. Ah, Stephanie. Culminating in a final battle between the forces of good and evil. My wife was dying. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows and in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Over 150 years ago, the soil of Manassas was awash in blood as the American Civil War raged. Two major battles at Bull Run saw more than 20,000 wounded or killed. There are those who believe the land around here has been permanently scarred, infused with the tortured souls of men, women, and children who died before their time. In the fall of 2008, Manassas resident Stephanie Winter attends a party at her friend Peter's apartment. She discovers he has a fascination with the dark arts. I noticed on his shelf he had books that I'd never heard of. The Necronomicon includes magic spells and advice on how to summon demons and spirits. Actually, it's a real useful book. Yeah, if you're dead, you should spend some time in my saloon, Peter. I was just hoping to spend a little bit more time with you. I think he got the wrong impression. <gasps> 
in his mind, I had feelings for him, which was not the case. What's the problem? You know what the problem is, man. I'm married, okay? Get it. I'm just paying you a compliment. Lay off. The more I tried to tell him no, the more persistent he got. <gasps> he pulled some of my hair out. What are you doing? Just getting what I need for a love spell. A love spell? You are sick! At that point, I was done. I didn't want any part of anybody who was into that sort of thing. Despite the strange night, Stephanie is up the next morning at 5 a.m., eager to get to work on the home she and her husband just moved into. You going to work this morning? Uh, it's late shifts. It's a lot of unpacking to do. The couple has been married for just a year. Stephanie's a bartender at a local restaurant. Her husband, Nicholas, works in construction. Did you have fun last night? I uh, should have stayed here. Something wrong? Everything all right? Yeah, no, everything's fine. I just, um, I just have a lot of unpacking to do. Yeah, well, once we get it done, we can finally call this place home. I was excited to be moving into a house out of an apartment, and it was a step in the direction that I was trying to go in life. Uh, yes. I'll be home by six tonight. OK. See ya. I was happier than I'd been in a really long time, and I was looking forward to making it home for my husband and I. You forgot something, babe? You forget something? What are you doing here? Peace offering. Did you wait until Nick left? No. I was just bringing you flowers. He was coming by my house 5.30 in the morning on his way to work, and it just really made me uncomfortable. Well, I didn't realize you wanted to get all dressed up for me. You need to leave, all right? Get out. OK? What? You don't want to say no to me. Get out! Get out! It got to the point where I felt like I was hiding in, you know, my own home. I finally had to completely shut it down and tell him to stop calling me, don't contact me. Please, nothing. Weeks go by. Stephanie's unwanted admirer stays away. But has he really heeded her request to leave her in peace? Is that? I don't know. Is there somebody in the house? I'm making my bed. No, wait, wait, wait. What if they have guns? I checked the windows. No one? No, th th nothing's unlocked. There was no way that it could have been an intruder. 
We're thinking maybe we didn't have it set up there right, or, you know, it slipped off or something. A lot of stuff that's heavy. Our nerves were all jangled. Eventually, we fell asleep and really didn't think too much more about it. Weeks later, Nick is working at home. As a hobby, he creates free tattoos for friends and enjoys the challenge of coming up with new designs. I see this candlestick thing hit the wall out of the corner of my eye. It made this big black mark on the wall. I started talking to my wife about it, and we were like, what can, the only thing that, that could be doing something like that would be like a ghost. Looking at her back, and I see blood start to form. What the hell did you do? What, what is it? What did you do? What is, baby, know. what did you do? You, no, you're bleeding. Hey, hey, you're bleeding. What is it? No, you, you don't want to take. You don't want to see this, okay? Just it's no, dead. no, just. It was really burning. It was just on fire. for love spell. There have been disturbing events in Nicholas and Stephanie Winter's home ever since she told a love-struck friend with a fascination for the dark arts to leave her alone. It is now February 2009, a year since the trouble started. Ah! 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 She was scared, and I was too, because there was no explanation for this. There were no tears in my clothing. I have a shirt on, I'm underneath blankets. How did that happen? A few days later, Stephanie receives a visit from a close friend, accompanied by someone who may be able to offer some answers. Uh, no, I haven't been anywhere, you know. Yeah. So, well, but thanks for thanks for bringing her by. Sure. Um, yeah. This is the lady I was telling you about. There was a lady that I knew through church, and she had a friend who's a sensitive. She could feel, see certain things. So, um, do you like the ten cent tour? Oh, she walked around and walked around the house and walked around outside. I sense the land has quite a history. She told me a husband and wife and their son. I know you've been unfaithful. No, no, I haven't been. The father was extremely jealous. Stop! Dad, stop! Boy, I've told you before! He ended up killing the mother and the son. Huh. It was the father that was haunting the property. I don't know if I reminded him of his wife or, or you know, what. Thank you. 
A few nights later, Stephanie's scratches don't appear to be healing. It shocked me in the sense that I was actually seeing a spirit. I'd only seen him for a couple of seconds, but I saw him, I mean, clear. The look on his face, I just, I'll never forget that. He, he just looked very sad. I don't know if it was the actual little boy that was killed on the property. I know that there are lost souls. I fully believe that. I believe that ghosts could communicate in their own way. I did not believe that they could physically harm you. Your skin open up when there's no explanation for it. The pain that goes along with it, it's like a liquid fire poured in there. Are you okay? I had to convince myself it was real over and over and over again, even though I saw it with my own eyes. Stephanie and Nick are too afraid of how people will react to share their experiences. We had nothing to compare it to and nobody to talk about it with, because who is there to talk to about something like that without sounding like you're crazy? All they can do is try to resume a normal life. Hey. Hey. How you doing? OK. Yeah. Does it hurt? Uh, yeah. Uh, I told you it would. <laughs> He's good, though. He's really good. I hope that's not the result of Nick's last attempt at a free tattoo. <laughs> no, it's uh, I just, I fell. just happened to you? Oh. oh. Right in front of him, just my leg just opened up. We got to get out of here. No, don't leave. Don't, don't go. She was being tortured. Tortured in a way that I've never thought was possible. I felt totally powerless. And I begged, why are you doing this to her? November 2009. What the hell just happened to you? Stephanie Winter comes under attack from a supernatural force. We gotta get out of here. No, don't leave. Don't, don't go. It's hard to go through. <laughs> we felt alone. Nick feels powerless to protect his wife. Why are you doing this to her? Could Peter, Stephanie's love-struck admirer, have placed a dark spell on her? Or are the attacks in some way related to the violence and twisted souls of men who died too young in the Civil War battles that rage nearby? A medium has offered a third possibility, that the spirit of a father who killed his wife and child here could be looking for his next victim. A week went by, then she got scratched again. And then another week went by, and she got scratched again. And it happened like that maybe half a dozen times. How do you explain those scratches to somebody? And especially if you get hold of somebody who doesn't believe in the paranormal. My husband would have been locked up. I'd have been in a loony bin somewhere. 
And then what do you do? Finally, the couple reluctantly decides to seek help from a paranormal investigator. Retired detective Rick Atrestein specializes in violent hauntings. The nature of Stephanie's scratches catches his attention. He's seen this before in his research photos. What was most interesting to me was that the, each wound appeared to be in, in, in a set of three scratches, three linear scratches side by side. The three scratch marks is indicative of a negative entity haunting. Three scratches are very commonplace with the demonic. And the reason that is, is because the symbol of three is a direct mockery of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If we're looking at a negative entity, usually it has to be invited or summoned somehow. I started taking into account the possibility that something happened to invite or to cause this phenomenon to occur to her. Is there anyone in your life that is involved in occult practices or someone who might mean you harm? There is this, this guy, um, Peter, and he just... started becoming like very stockish with me and uh, and mentioned something about a love spell. It's possible that he could have put a curse on her. I wasn't expecting to hear that. Stephanie is now convinced Peter may have unleashed some dark force to torment her. Everything kind of fell into place. Everything made a little bit more sense. Okay, this is, this is what's going on. This is why it's doing that. This is why it has so much power. Rick agrees to conduct a paranormal investigation the following week. Until then, the evil presence could attack at any time. Get out of my house. Get out of my house! Get out! I was very angry and very confrontational, and I wanted it out. No more! You hear me? No more! Get out of my house! This thing was such a coward, and it was just attacking in the middle of the night and just out of nowhere and when your back is turned and that's what made me so angry. Where are you? Leave me alone! Where are you? Where are you? What? You here? Leave me alone! Where are you? Help me, help me find it! Help me find it, please. Help me find it. Help me find it. Help me find it. Help me find it. Just go away. I begged my wife to move out of the house because I felt like the house was evil. I just wanted away from it. But then after talking with Rick, he said, well, you know, that might not work. In cases this severe, sometimes the entity will follow you no matter where you go. Rick and a colleague set up electronic surveillance equipment to monitor every room in the house, hoping to capture video evidence of something supernatural. During this first phase of the investigation, I tried to document what was going on, tried to experience something that uh, that would lend me to believe that what she was telling me was true. Probably not asleep right now. I'm sure we're going to hear 
Unfortunately, I was unable to document or see or experience anything, but I was still of the opinion that something was happening. I just felt you know, in my heart that something was going on. It would stay hidden when Rick was out, but as soon as he left, I would get scratched. I became afraid to leave my wife alone because at that point, it became an every other day thing almost, or at least a couple of times a week. You doing OK, baby? You want something to eat? I'm not hungry. It was playing mind games with her because I could definitely tell that her spirit was being crushed. I think that it was trying to influence her into giving up. You haven't been out of the house in days. I don't. I don't want anyone to see me like this. Can you understand that? I didn't want to go out in public because I was covered in bandages all the time. I was so depressed. I, I didn't want to be around anybody. I didn't want to see anybody whose life was normal because my life was so far out of whack that I was jealous. I'm going to make a sandwich. Would you like one? Fine. I'll make you one anyway. I could feel somebody on top of me. I felt hands around my throat. Step. 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 I thought my wife was dying. Let her go! Do you want to hurt somebody? You hurt me, but you let her go! For more, a haunting. Go to DestinationAmerica.com. Stephanie Winter suspects a former friend who developed an obsession with her... You don't want to say no to me. ...has cast a dark spell... ...unleashing a demonic spirit to extract his revenge. Something unseen is now trying to kill her. I could hear Nick talking to me. I could hear him calling me. Steph? And I remember the only thing I could move was my left pinky. Let her go! Do you want to hurt somebody? You hurt me, but you let her go! I was so mad about it. I was threatening it. Come and get me. Come get me. Why are you going to pick on her? <laughs> All of a sudden, she just <gasps> grabbed a breath of air, and she sat up. <coughs> we must have sat there like that for quite a while. It was very easily capable of killing me. They tell paranormal investigator Rick Atrestein about the violent attack. Being that it was spiritual in nature, logic would dictate that the solution is probably spiritual in nature. So I contacted a demonologist and asked their opinion as to what we could do to stem this activity, to quell these attacks. The demonologist gives Rick instructions for a sealing ritual. He suggested I get some blessed candles, 100% beeswax candles. And the incense, and the incense is already lit. And some pontifical incense, and some holy water have the candles and the pontifical incense blessed by a priest, and then burn those, the candles and the incense. Incense has been used in religious rituals since the time of the pharaohs. To Roman Catholics, it symbolizes the prayers of the faithful rising to heaven. Through the world. And then you'll also recite the prayer I gave you. This will seal the house with positive energy and keep you safe. That gave me a little bit of hope because there was positive forces that were now involved that we had hope of running this thing out. Listen to the words you're saying. 
listen to the meaning behind them. And in every room, you need to do the same thing. Let's move through there, and you can recite that prayer as we walk. All right, let's, let's move on. St. Michael, the, the archangel. archangel. Defend us in, in battle. battle. We would do that every single night, and it really did seem to work. Against it's the wickedness, wickedness and snares of the devil. After a couple of months of it just being quiet, I'd gotten used to it, and I was relieved. You know, you try to put your life back together a little bit and kind of reflect, like, wow, you know, I didn't really go through that. Stephanie gets used to her new nightly routine, convinced she is now safe again. It's March 2011, a year since Stephanie started performing the sealing ritual. And snares of the devil, O prince of the heavenly host, in the name of God, cast Satan and his evil spirits into hell, who roam the earth seeking the destruction of souls. What do you think it was, babe? I don't know, but I don't think he's stupid enough to come back here. We were standing at the front window kind of watching to see if we could see anything, anybody kind of hanging around. <laughs> this thing grabbed the back of my head and just yanked me down. Did you hurt your neck? You okay? Shh, don't move, don't move, don't move, just relax. That was absolutely devastating because I thought it was over with. <sighs> Nicholas called me. He was very frantic. He said that the attacks had resumed. In April 2011, paranormal investigator Rick Atristein begins a 48-hour investigation, hoping to gather evidence to justify a formal Catholic exorcism. In order to get the Catholic Church involved, it takes a great deal of evidence and a great deal of documentation. Stephanie. What? There's something I need to ask you. What? Maybe you shouldn't use the sealing ritual while we're here. You want to use me as bait? If you're not comfortable with it, I'm certainly not going to try to convince you. No. No. Let's do this. I was pretty much willing to do whatever I had to do to get some kind of evidence. Rick and a member of his investigation team will stay up all night monitoring camera feeds. On night one, there's disappointment as nothing happens. They return to their posts for night two. She's having a tough time again, sleeping. Yeah, she is. Virginia, 
Stephanie Winter is being tortured and tormented by a demonic entity. It may have been unleashed through a spell cast by a spurned former friend who became obsessed with her. Paranormal investigator Rick Etrestein believes an exorcism by the Catholic Church may be necessary, but first he needs to capture proof of the evil presence. I've got it. Are you okay? The wound to her arm was so severe that in the kitchen itself, where she was standing, there was a pool of blood. There was also some minor blood spatter on the wall adjacent to where she was standing, which indicates to me that there was some force applied to that particular scratch. But the evidence is not strong enough to take to the Catholic Church. The video evidence was significant, but not conclusive as far as I'm concerned, because she was in and out of the kitchen. If I want to take a skeptical stance, she could have done it in, in another room, come in, and pretended that she got scratched. I was kind of mad about that. I was like, oh, man, all right. The investigation continues. I see it. I've got it. She needs me. Go, go, go. 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 Oh. Oh. I actually saw the welts form in three scratches, linear scratches side by side, and I saw them start to bleed. At that point in time, I knew that she did not scratch herself, that they were fresh. We got it. We got it. <laughs> that piece of evidence was more significant than the, than the original scratching because of the time period that she was under constant surveillance. We felt so good. It was like, thank God, Rick finally saw this. He saw it with his eyes, and he's got it on camera. I knew that I had something of a negative nature. Rick contacts David Considine, a lay religious demonologist in Connecticut, whose work is officially sanctioned by the Catholic Church. Anytime that we're having outward manifestations where we're getting scratching uh, and or someone's being punched or something of that nature, it's always reason for concern. We do have exorcists that work with us. What we had planned was for a mass to be initiated in her name. He suspected that uh, she might be under demonic oppression. Demonic oppression is when a person starts to come under control of the entity. It's just a step away from becoming fully possessed. If that were in fact the case, she should show some type of adverse effect from this, even at that distance. This was not revealed to Stephanie, nor was it revealed to Nicholas. The day of the mass arrives. As a priest in Chicago prepares, 700 miles away in Manassas, Virginia, Rick arrives at Stephanie's. Hey. Huh. I didn't expect to see you today. I know. I left my notebook in here. Do you mind oh. if I come in a minute? No, no, of course not. Come on in. That pray certain service to us, Stephanie Winter. The priest begins the mass for Stephanie. Perpetua Semper Virginis Intercessione. So did your friend review the evidence at all, or? Yes, he did. He's reviewing it right now. Perpetua Mentis et Corporis Sanitate Gaudere. Gloriosae Beatae Mariae. As we forgive those who trespass against us, the blood of Christ, 
Sit down here. Lean back. That's it. Depart, Satan. I felt fine one second, and I felt like somebody set a bomb off in my head. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. For more than two years, Stephanie Winter has been tormented by a negative entity at her home in Manassas, Virginia. A haunting that may owe its origins to a dark spell unleashed by a former friend in revenge for Stephanie rejecting his attempts to win her heart. In the spring of 2011, a priest 700 miles away performs a mass in her name, hoping the demon will make its presence known. I did not reveal this information to Stephanie. She did not know anything about it. Gloriasi, Beatae Mariae, Liberare Tristitia, Quaesumus Domini Deus, Liberare Tristitia. Oh my God, I'm so dizzy. Per Christum Domini Nostrum, Amen. She had a severe migraine headache. Oh, my, my head, I don't feel good. That was a diagnostic indicator that this was probably a legitimate demonic oppression. Stephanie is in imminent danger of becoming fully possessed by this evil spirit. Rick contacts religious demonologist David Considine, who arranged the diagnostic mass with the priest in Chicago. No, no, she's sick. She needs our help. We felt that it was something that could be handled by the minor form of exorcism. There's not enough time for the church to sanction a full exorcism. Instead, paranormal investigator Rick Atrestein will try to drive out the demon. Rick was instructed to purge himself, to clean himself, as it were, on a spiritual level. It is intense, and I fear for Stephanie. I absolve you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that way he could be stronger for Stephanie and for himself, and to lessen the possibility that he could come under possession. I knew the clash was imminent. I knew the clash was coming. Something was going to happen. Rick is finally ready to take on a demon. Are you okay? Are you ready for this? Yeah. There's power in God and his word. I'm gonna read the entire ritual. Whatever happens, I want you to keep reading along with me. Most glorious prince of the heavenly armies. Most, Most glorious, glorious prince, prince of, of the, the heavenly, heavenly armies. Saint Michael the Archangel. Saint, Saint Michael, Michael the, the Archangel. Archangel. Defend us in our battle Defend us in our battle against principalities and powers. Against, against principalities and powers. Against the rulers of this world of darkness. Against the rulers of this world of darkness. Against the spirits of wickedness in the high places. Against the spirits of wickedness in the high places. From the snares of the devil deliver us, O Lord. From the snares of the devil, devil deliver, deliver us, O Lord. Lord. From the snares of the devil deliver us, O Lord. From the snares of the devil deliver us, O Lord. From the snares of the devil deliver us, O Lord. From the snares of the devil deliver us, O Lord. God arises. God arises. His enemies are scattered. His enemies are scattered. As smoke is driven away. As smoke is driven away. So they are driven. So they are driven. As wax melts before the flame, as, as wax, wax melts before, before the flame, flame, so the wicked perish at the presence of God. So the wicked perish at the presence of God. Most precious heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Place your hands there. Most precious heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most precious heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most precious heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. I think it's over. Yes, yes, I think it's over. It's over. 
For now, it appears that the house belongs only to the living. It's been about two years since anything's happened, thankfully. And slowly, uh, Nicholas and I have gotten our lives back on track and are able to kind of loosen up and laugh. It's funny how much you miss laughing when you don't do it for a couple of years. I've been able to see things that give me confirmation that there is demons or a devil and that there's a God. The couple continues to wonder what caused the haunting and if it has gone for good. Did Stephanie's love-struck former friend cast a spell and conjure a demon? Rick did bring that up to me, that Peter could have done that. He could very well have brought this thing to me. More than anything, Stephanie wonders about the ghost of a boy that appeared to her. I don't know if it was this demon that was in my house trying to gain my trust, or if it was the actual little boy asking for help, but I've never seen him again. I'm still on edge because I don't know if it's completely gone or if it's just dormant again.